In the next three chapters, we're going to cover some biochemistry. And the way we've broken this down is that we're going to spend each of these chapters looking at the three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. So uh, let's start off with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are uh, they have a wide variety of uses in biochemistry. Um, I think one of their more fundamental uses is, uh, especially as sugars, just uh, energy storage molecules. Uh, they're very, uh, you know, way, uh, way to store energy that's readily accessible uh, for most organisms. Um, in the case of some of the more complex carbohydrates, they can be used for uh, just for structural purposes. So think like cellulose in plants. Um, and uh, of course, going down to like you know things like DNA and RNA, the uh, the sort of rungs of our of our double helix in DNA come from that uh, carbohydrate uh, you know polymer forming that. Now the term carbohydrate uh, implies that you've got carbon and water. Uh, that's not entirely true. Like uh, you, you don't have literal. It's it's not the same set up as you see in a hydrate salt where uh, you have water molecules embedded in the crystal structure. Uh, instead here the water comes from um, alcohol groups and hydrogens being attached to each carbon in your carbon chain save the um, the two terminal ones. So uh, basically uh, I, I'll show you a Fisher pro, uh, projection of this in the next slide, but uh, you can see here that if you look at each of these carbons in the middle, uh, we have our carbon with an alcohol group and a hydrogen that's not shown. Uh, the H and the OH forming the uh, the water of the quote unquote hydrate part of that. Okay, though even though technically that's not a hydrate. You probably remember from high school biology or just lower level biology in general. Uh, that glucose, one of the fundamental carbohydrates, uh, fundamental sugars, is produced by plants uh, by uh, photosynthesis. So plants, uh, green plants, take carbon dioxide and water vapor, um, and in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll, they convert that into glucose. All right, and uh, we get oxygen as a byproduct. Uh, and of course, this glucose uh, works its way up throughout the food chain, right? You've got plants that eat an uh, animals that eat plants, uh, animals that eat other animals, and so on. Okay, uh, so this is basically a way to fundamentally take sunlight and have it sort of power an ecosystem. Okay, now a quick note I want to draw your attention to. Uh, you know, notice that each of these carbons here are chiral inside our chain, right? We've got uh, basically chiral centers where we've got four different groups coming off of those carbons, right? Our alcohol group, the hydrogen that are not shown, and then this carbon group and this carbon group that are different from each other. Um, also note that the two terminal carbons are not chiral. We have, uh, you know, two hydrogens over here, so that's just a CH2 group. Um, and over here we have a carbonyl. Okay, so that's going to be something that we're going to notice in all of our carbohydrates. There's going to be a carbonyl present at one end of the molecule. In this case, it happens to be an aldehyde, uh, but though that need not be the case. You could have a carbonyl on that second carbon, then you'd have a ketone, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so here's a Fisher projection. Uh, we talked about Fisher projections uh, way back in you know the first semester when we were just talking about how to represent molecules in general. Um, and Fisher projections are very convenient here uh, because of all those chiral centers in the middle of our molecule. Okay, so uh, the thing that's really convenient here with your Fisher projection, uh, based on the setup that we've got here, uh, is that the alcohol group kind of tells you what the uh, chirality or what the designation is for each of those chiral centers. Uh, basically, if your alcohol group is pointing to the right, uh, that's an R, uh, you know, basically that is R chirality. And if uh, we have the alcohol group on the left, it's going to have an S designation. Okay, so you can, you know, name these accordingly. So you've probably heard a few names of carbohydrates at this point. I've probably said things like glucose and cellulose, um, and and you could probably you've probably heard of other carbohydrates just from general knowledge. Things like uh, fructose or lactose or sucrose and so on. Uh, so you've probably noticed a pattern there, right? That ose ending at the end. Um, 
you know, that basically is going to be the general suffix for a carbohydrate. So you should be able to re readily recognize it. I'm going to add a few more terms here. We're going to make this, uh, you know, de uh, distinctions between all doses and ketoses. And we're going to then uh, have other names that have a Greek prefix for a number in front. So things like uh, pentose or a hexose or a tetros and so on. Okay, so what do those two things tell us? Well, you've probably started to guess. Uh, the difference between an aldose and a ketose is the presence of an aldehyde group or a ketone group. So you can see over here, glucose is an aldose. Okay, our carbonyl is on that number one carbon, and therefore that's an aldehyde. Okay, that's what makes that an aldose. Fructose, on the other hand, has its carbonyl at the number two position. Okay, so that carbonyl has two carbons attached to it, and therefore is a ketone, and that makes fructose a ketose. Now, for the uh, things designations like pentose and hexose and so on, uh, you have to count the number of carbons in your chain. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So glucose is a hexose with its six carbons. Fructose has one, two, three, four, five, six, and is also a hexose. All right. So the smallest monosaccharide we can have with one chiral center is glyceraldehyde. All right. So uh, you know, it's a triose, if you if you will. You've got three carbons here. Okay. Now, you can have your at that one chiral carbon. You can have your alcohol group pointing right or pointing left. So, uh, again, if uh, if our alcohol group is pointing to the right, it's that R designation, uh, and if it goes to the left, it's uh, you know an S designation, right? However. Uh, notice that we also distinguish between our two isomers, or our two enantiomers of glyceraldehyde using this plus or minus designation. Now, if you recall, uh, basically when you have, uh, when we look at light shining on our, uh, you know, plain polarized light shining on our sample of our enantiomer, if we have just one enantiomer, uh, it'll deflect it one way and the and it's an antimer. The other enantiomer will deflect it the other way, right? And that's where we have these plus or minus designations or dextrorotatory or levorotatory designations, right? Uh, D or L. So in this case, uh, the isomer, the, the enantiomer that has that R designation happens to be dextrorotatory, right? So you'd have a D here or a plus here. Uh, and this chiral center happens to be R, right? Recto. Whereas here, the one where that chiral center is left, uh, sinister, uh, happens to be levorotatory, okay? So this obviously begs the question then, can we predict based on, you know, the RRS designation of our chiral centers, whether our, you know, our monosaccharide is gonna be, you know, dextrorotatory or levorotatory? And the answer is no. You cannot, and you have to determine that experimentally. This is, uh, by the way, a very common trick question. Uh, you can pretty much guarantee uh, that you'll see it on a quiz or exam or both. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, you, you might remember this uh, this trick question from uh, from back in that chapter when we learned about uh, you know do, doing this experiment to determine whether things are dextrorotatory or levorotatory, right? Um, you you have to. Uh, you know, that R and S designation tells you about the structure itself, but that does not necessarily tell you how it's going to deflect the light. Now, when we look at other sugars, we use that last chiral carbon, the, the one at the bottom, furthest away from the carbonyl, uh, to designate that D or L designation, right? So if we have our alcohol group point to the right, so it's got an R configuration, we say that the, um, you know, that sugar is a D sugar. So, you know, so here we have D ribose, D glucose, and D fructose, respectively. But now you probably have noticed a contradiction in what I just said, right? Uh, we're using that D designation there, um, even though we don't know, um, you know, you need experimentation to figure out whether this will deflect light to the left or to the right. Okay, so what this means then is that you can't, uh, that D doesn't refer to dextrorotatory anymore. Okay, you have to use uh, plus or minus designation for dextrorotatory and levorotatory. 
uh, D just here just refers to uh, you know that sugar's configuration uh, kind of like how we refer to R and S except we use R and S for individual chiral centers here we use uh, R and S uh, we use D and L for effectively the entire structure, but it's determined from that bottom carbon, okay, that bottom chiral carbon, okay? So for example here, uh, both of these molecules are D sugars, right? If you look at that bottom chiral carbon, they have that alcohol group pointing to the right, uh, and they're both aldotetroses, right? They have an aldehyde group and they have four carbons, right? So they're tetros. Uh, but they are different sugars, right? Because they know that they differ on that uh, top chiral carbon. Okay, uh, so again, you could call these erythros and uh, threos, but you, in order to, you know, distinguish them from their enantiomers, you would have to call them, you know, D erythros because that alcohol group is pointing to the right, or D threos because it's pointing to the right. Okay, so. That tells us then that there are four aldotetroses. Uh, we just went over two of them. Okay, you've got D-erythros and D-3-os. Uh, so what are the other two? Well, as I pointed out, you've got the enantiomers of these, right? Uh, you can have L-erythros and L-3-os, uh, where you just have the mirror image of these. So uh, L-erythros has, you know, both of its alcohol groups on the left. Okay, and uh, D uh, or sorry, L threos has uh, its alcohol groups on the right and the left, respectively. Both of these chiral centers are flipped. Okay, so there we go. So that's what that looks like. Okay, and again, uh, if you ever get you know just shown a structure like this, and you're like, well, what's the designation for it? You can always look at that bottom uh, carbon and you know see if that alcohol group is pointing to the left or the right, and that'll tell you if it's D or L. Okay. Uh, in terms of whether you've got erythros versus threos, uh, I guess the fact that these are both uh, the same okay, tells you that they're erythros, and the fact that they're opposites tells you that these are threos. Okay. Uh, quick note here about your uh, sugars. Uh, don't uh, stress too much about memorizing the configurations of uh, the structures of all of the individual sugars. Uh, on a quiz or exam, I'll provide you with you know, with structures if you need it, or I'll give you some information. I, I don't expect you to memorize, you know, that, uh, the, you know, the chiral centers in, in erythros have, in D erythros have to be R and R. Um, that's not something I would expect you to know. Okay. All right. So next up, we have the aldopentoses. So we just went over the aldotetroses. We've got aldopentoses here. So we have aldehyde groups at the end and five carbons. Okay, and now we have three chiral centers instead of two. Now, here we're going to have eight different isomers that we can find. Four uh, D isomers and then there are four enantiomers. Okay, so notice that uh, we went from uh, two isomers of glyceraldehyde, uh, the two enantiomers, right, plus or minus glyceraldehyde, because it had one chiral center, and then we went uh, from that to four isomers of, uh, you know, of tetroses, which had two chiral centers, and now we've got eight. So notice that we essentially are getting a number of isomers uh, using the formula two to the power of n, where n is the number of chiral centers, okay? So again, this hopefully should be ringing a bell from, um, you know, from back when we first learned about chiral centers way back in chapter five. All right, so here are the, you know, one half of all of those for the aldopentoses. So we have our three chiral centers. Uh, we have ribose, where all of these are on the same side, you know, and here we've got arabinose, uh, xylose, and uh, lyxose. And of course, if we just do the mirror images of each of these, we then have the L isomers. Okay. Um, again, some of those names are probably, you know, probably sound a little familiar. Ribose, of course, is the uh, R in RNA, okay, and uh, deoxyribose, where uh, you basically remove uh, one of these alcohol groups and replace it with a hydrogen. Uh, that's basically the the deoxyribose. That's the D in DNA. Okay, uh, xylose may also ring a bell. You may remember that from uh, you know, along with cellulose as being you know part of the uh, sort of the building blocks of wood. Okay.
So if we scale up to hexoses, you could probably figure out that instead of eight isomers, they've got to be 16, right? Two to the power of four would be 16. And out of those, eight are the D isomers and eight are the, uh, the L isomers. Okay, so we've been talking about all doses for quite a bit. Let's talk a little bit more about ketoses. I mentioned earlier that in the case of a ketose, your carbonyl is at the number two carbon um, in your carbon chain of your carbohydrate as opposed to the number one carbon that would make it an aldose. Uh, so having that number two carbon then means that we have, uh, you know, it's got two carbons coming off of it, of course, which makes it a ketone group. Now, what this then does is it removes the possibility for another chiral center. So for example, in the case of a trialdose, uh, your central carbon is chiral, so you can have uh, two variants there. In the case of an, uh, you know, of a triketose, uh, there is no chiral carbon. Notice our number one carbon has two hydrogens on it, making it achiral, and our number three carbon also has two hydrogens on it, making it achiral. And of course, our carbonyl is, you know, trigonal planar and therefore achiral anyway. All right, so uh, so you can see here that. Uh, for our triketose, there's only one possibility in dihydroxyacetone. Okay, so it's when we move up to a uh, tetros here, a uh, tetraketose, that we have our first introduction of a chiral center and the possibility of a D and an L isomer. So you can see here as we insert more and more carbons, we extend our carbon chain, we get more chiral centers and increase our number of possibilities. So uh, once we get to five carbons, once we get to uh, pentoses here, now we have two chiral centers, which gives us two to the power of two or four uh, different isomers. Okay, so here are the two D isomers. And of course we have the corresponding mirror images which aren't shown. Um, then once we get, you know, insert another carbon and we have uh, eight possible isomers, and again, here are the four D isomers shown. Um, you know, and that's and that's about it in terms of the more common, uh, you know, ketoses you're going to come across. Uh, again, you know, don't stress about memorizing the chiral configuration, the RNS configurations of every possible sugar. For the most part, you'll be given a reference in a quiz or exam. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about. Um, how, you know, so far we've seen these Fisher projections that show our, our monosaccharides in a sort of a straight line, a straight chain. But in solution, these monosaccharides actually take a cyclical form. So let's talk about how that happens. Uh, the mechanism for this is actually something you've seen before in our chapter on aldehydes and ketones. Uh, it's actually the formation of a hemiacetal that we, we see. Because keep in mind that your carbohydrates have alcohol groups and carbonyl. So you already have the pieces you need to form a hemiacetal. So what happens is your uh, alcohol group, one of your alcohol groups acts as a nucleophile and attacks that carbonyl carbon, you know, and basically converts that carbonyl oxygen into another alcohol group. And in doing so, closes the ring. Okay, now typically you'll get five or six membered rings. They're just more stable from a torsional strain uh, standpoint. So, so that's typically what you're going to see. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to gloss over this. We've we've talked about uh, you know um, what's it uh, hemiastyle formation before. Like I said, basically you have your you know your alcohol group uh, you know act do a nucleophilic attack here. Um, and you know these electrons swing up here and then you've got a negative charge and that just gets protonated. Okay, so in the case of a, uh, of a monosaccharide though, the important thing is how do we draw that cyclic product and how do we maintain or represent the, uh, the chirality of all the other carbons, right? The, the configurations of all of them, okay? So when we draw that closed, uh, that cyclic formation, uh, the cyclic uh, structure, uh, we usually draw it in this form, what's called a Hayworth projection. So we have our five or six membered ring here, and we represent all of our other carbons, uh, the, the groups coming off all of our other carbons, using these straight lines pointing up or down. Okay, and uh, essentially all that's different, really you could use this template and uh, just draw that and then take your uh, Fisher projection 
And based on your R or S configuration at each of those chiral carbons, just place your alcohol and hydrogens accordingly, pointing up or down. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about how to do that. But you can see here that uh, essentially when we do our Hayworth projection, our number one carbon uh, is this one over here at the right. Okay, uh, and you can see that uh, we we no longer have a carbonyl. This becomes you know an alcohol group now. Whether that alcohol group's pointing up or down, uh, we'll we'll get into that. That's the alpha or beta versions of this, um, uh, or the different anomers, so to speak, of this Hayworth projection. I'll get to that in a second. For each of these other uh, carbons. Uh, Look at your RRS configuration. Uh, it might help to think of your, uh, you know, basically you're rotating this clockwise. So this carbonyl carbon is coming down here and to the right, as shown over here. And accordingly, all of your groups, uh, you know, any groups that are to the right are pointing downwards. So you can see here, for example, in this number two carbon, this alcohol group's pointing to the right, it's pointing downwards over here. And likewise, any groups that are on the left are pointing upwards. So you can see here on this number three carbon, we have our alcohol group to the left. Over here in our Hayworth projection, it's pointing upwards. Okay. All right. In the case of our number six carbon, uh, since it's the alcohol group on our number five carbon that closes the ring, that's our, our oxygen over here. Uh, obviously, there's not going to be any you know groups coming off of that. Uh, that oxygen's happy with its two bonds. Uh, that sixth carbon comes off of our fifth carbon here. It's pointing upwards like that. I mentioned earlier that the alcohol group on that number one carbon can point either up or down. Now, the reason for this is that uh, when your monosaccharides in its open form, uh, your carbonyl is flat. Remember that sp2 carbon is trigonal planar. So that alcohol group can attack either from the top or the bottom. And accordingly, you'll get either one of these anomers. Okay, so um, anomer, by the way, spelled A-N-O-M-E-R. And that's the difference between these two, two molecules when uh, you form that alcohol group. So if it attacks from the top, the alcohol group uh, forms pointing downwards and vice versa. If it attacks from the bottom, the alcohol group points upwards. Okay, uh, so if that alcohol group is uh, trans to your um, uh, your CH2OH group here that's pointing upwards, okay? Uh, we call that alpha, the alpha anomer. And if they are cis, if those two groups are cis, that number six carbon and that alcohol group are cis to each other, uh, that's the beta anomer, okay? Uh, sometimes it might be easier, usually since this number six carbon is usually drawn pointed upwards, uh, it's typically, you know, that alcohol groups downwards for alpha and upwards for beta. That's another quick way usually to recognize that. Uh, quick note here about the uh, ring closed uh, names of, um, of our glucose rings once it forms that, that uh, hemiacetal. Um, typically, depending on if you have a five or six membered ring, uh, your suffix here will be either furanose or pyranose. Uh, the reason being that furan is a uh, five-membered heterocycle where you have an oxygen present. Uh, think tetrahydrofuran, the um, uh, your uh, the solvent. Okay, and uh, pyran is a similar molecule but with a six-membered ring. So you have a six-membered ring like this, uh, but with an oxygen as one of the hetero as a heteroatom making up that ring. Okay, so in other words, if you swap out all these alcohol groups and this CH2OH group for hydrogens, you would basically have pyran. Okay, so that's where the name comes from. Um, uh, in terms of the relationship between your alpha and beta anomers, uh, note that this number one carbon is now a chiral center, right? Uh, so while it was achiral as a carbonyl, once that alcohol group forms, these are two chiral centers. So accordingly, um, you know, keep in mind that all these other chiral centers are staying intact. You're only flipping that anomeric carbon. And so these two molecules are diastereomers of each other. Okay, so uh, 
Yeah, here we have uh, our two animers. Uh, you, you can help distinguish between them. Um, I mean, obviously from the structure by looking at whether those that alcohol group is cis or trans to that number six carbon. Uh, but also experimentally, uh, you can since these are both uh, you know diastereomers of each other, uh, they'll deflect light differently. Now, if I didn't mention it earlier. Uh, these, these cyclic hemiastyles are the stable form of your monosaccharides in solution. Uh, the, uh, you know, if you didn't notice on an earlier slide, I, I you know, basically mentioned that we have a very, very, very small percentage of the open form. Um, and instead, these are more stable in solution. Now, there is a slight difference uh, between the stability of these two, but the fact remains that you get a mixture uh, of these two in solution. So, so something to keep in mind that uh, even though, even if you start off with a pure anomer, uh, you'll wind up having one, uh, f you know, converting into the other, and you'll get a mixture of the two. All right. Now that process of forming a mixture of these two anomers is known as muta rotation. Okay. So basically, uh, you've got uh, your, if you start off with one anomer, uh, it'll go via the open form as an intermediate, um, but it will eventually reform a cyclic hemiastyle. And when it does that, it might go back to the original form or it might produce some of the other anomer. And so you get a mixture. Now again, you might have um, one form dominate over the other, you'll get a higher percentage of one versus the other, uh, and that's fine, but you're going to get a mixture of the two. Okay, now another thing to keep in mind uh, with the way we draw these things, uh, typically with sugars, we'll draw them as either these Fisher projections or these Hayworth projections. They're usually the, the simplest, easiest way to see where our alcohol groups are on our chiral centers. Uh, that being said, keep in mind that, you know, these Hayworth projections are uh, basically, you know, a six-membered ring, and as such, we can draw a, uh, a chair form just as we would for a cyclohexane. Okay, so, uh, you know, so basically uh, you might see a Hayworth projection instead of drawn, well, as a Hayworth projection, um, you could draw it instead as this uh, chair uh, form. Uh, you'll sometimes see this chair form drawn, uh, especially in the case of, uh, you know, disaccharides or polysaccharides, uh, since this takes up a little bit uh, less space uh, than, you know, our, our big Hayworth projection uh, and kind of shows what this looks like, you know, in 3D. Uh, this is sometimes a better way to draw it when showing it in the grand scheme of a larger like disaccharide or polysaccharide. All right, so so you'll probably notice that later on. But like I said, if, if we're looking at uh, the stereochemistry of the individual chiral centers, our Fisher or Hayworth projection is usually more useful. Okay, let's practice this. Uh, so here we have a pr Fisher projection of D manos. Uh, let's go ahead and draw the Hayworth projection of this. Uh, when you draw the Hayworth projection, draw the pyranose. So draw a six-membered ring uh, with the oxygen sort of in that top, top right corner. Um, I guess we haven't really seen any examples of furanoses yet. But uh, anyway, draw draw a uh, six-membered ring, uh, a pyranose of D manos. Okay, so if you've uh, paused this and come back, I'll go ahead and put up the slide. But uh, again, remember, you want to flip this 90 degrees to the right, okay, so, or flip it clockwise. Um, and you're going to have uh, uh, basically all of your groups that are on the right pointing downwards, all the groups that are left are pointing upwards. Uh, please note the question is asking you to draw the alpha form. So your um, alcohol group on your number one carbon, your anomeric carbon, uh, is going to be pointing downwards, as you can see here. So here's that anomeric carbon. Okay, so there's your Hayworth projection of that, and that's good practice. Um, oh, it, it also, I guess, uh, drawing the chair conformation is not a bad practice either. But you can see, uh, once you've got your, you can use your chair template. Um, you know, just use uh, this oxygen here is that atom here, right? You can use that point of your chair over there. Um, it's basically you know, if you have a group pointing downwards, uh, it's, it's kind of very similar to how we, we drew cyclohexane chair conformations before, right? If you have a group pointing downwards on a down carbon, it's axial. Likewise, if it's upwards on an up carbon, it's also axial. Uh, so you can see that in the case of these two axial groups here, okay? Uh, if you have an up group on a down carbon, it's equatorial. Uh, 
and vice versa, a down group and an up carbon is also equatorial. Okay, so keep that in mind. So if you have this oxygen as an up atom, you know, have this carbon is down, this one is up, down, up, down, okay, in your, in your chair, all right? And then accordingly, uh, you know, decide whether your groups are going to be axial or equatorial from that. Okay, so here are what, uh, you know, so here we have a ketos. Uh, ketoses can form both uh, furanoses and pyranoses. Okay, so this is what a furanose ring looks like, by the way. Okay, so here's our five-membered ring. Uh, we have that oxygen at the top of the pentagon that's formed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, with a pyranose, we've seen that the um, oxygen's at that top right of the hexagon that we draw. Okay, but here's a furanose. Um, and yeah, in the case of our ketose, we can have either um, our alcohol on our number five carbon closing the ring, okay, to make our furanose, or we can have our alcohol on our number six carbon closing the ring, and that makes a pyranose accordingly. Okay, so please note that at that point, the number six carbon has only two hydrogens on it, and so both your up and down groups are hydrogens there. I mentioned earlier with uh, with our examples of uh, aldoses that uh, the open chain, uh, the open form of our monosaccharide is typically not very stable in solution. We can see that again here with our ketones. We have a very small percentage of that. Uh, but please note that we have um, all the different forms of our ketose uh, present in solution. We're going to get different percentages of those. So we're talking about the alpha and beta anomers of both the pyranose and the furanose. Okay. Um, now, while the beta pyranose is the most, uh, still, uh, the highest percentage that we see here in the case of fructose, um, it's actually the, the furanose ring that we see uh, taking part in most of the reactions in biochemical pathways. Speaking of which, let's talk about the reactions that monosaccharides can undergo. So uh, generally, your functional groups are alcohol groups and carbonyl. So those are the, you know, the main branches of reactions that we're going to look at. Uh, one key one is to uh, swap out our alcohol groups for something that's not protic. Uh, so remember, the alcohol groups engage in hydrogen bonding, uh, and that's what makes your monosaccharides water soluble. So if you want to improve your solubility in an organic solvent, uh, you need to swap out those alcohol groups for something that's well, not protic. So one way to do that is to take acetic anhydride and pyridine, uh, and that will replace your uh, alcohol groups with acetate groups. All right. uh, the pyridines used to soak up the extra protons there. Okay. Uh, another um, uh, you know functional group we can convert our alcohols into is ethers. So instead of esters, we convert them into ethers, um, and this is easy enough uh, by taking uh, you know easily accomplished by taking um, a um, alkyl halide and having your alcohol come in as a nucleophile. So it basically does, uh, you know, an SN2 substitution um, and uh, swaps out those alkyl groups or swaps out the protons for alkyl groups. So you've got uh, the corresponding ethers. I mentioned that our cyclic form of our monosaccharides is a hemiacetal, right? So in order to close that ring, uh, your alcohol group, uh, you know, converts your carbonyl into an alcohol group, and therefore you've got your hemiacetal. If you react your hemiacetal with an alcohol, you'll convert it into an acetal. We've seen this back in our chapter on aldehydes and ketones, uh, and that's no different here. All right, so we can swap out that anomeric al alcohol group uh, for a, uh, you know, for an alkoxy group by reacting with a. Uh, an alcohol in the presence of an acid. Please note that the uh, acetal equivalent of our sugars is known as a glycoside. Um, that word's going to sound familiar later, later on when we talk about glycosidic linkages. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that since you go through an sp2 hybridized intermediate, uh, the resulting product, uh, you, you get a mixture of uh, both the alpha and uh, beta anomers of your acetal. Okay, it doesn't matter which one you, which uh, anomer you start off with, you wind up getting a mixture of those two products. Okay.
Um, oh, another really important thing to note here is unlike the previous examples where we did reactions at all of the alcohol groups, uh, here it's only the anomeric uh, alcohol group that's replaced. All right, and so here's the mechanism. Again, this should look pretty familiar from, from what you remember of uh, acetal formation from hemiacetals. Another interesting reaction we can see here is uh, the conversion between glucose and mannose. Now, glucose and mannose are a special type of diastereomer called epimers. That's, uh, so epimers are basically diastereomers that only differ uh, at one position, okay, at one chiral center. Whereas, you know, diastereomers can, you know, if you have multiple chiral centers, diastereomers can include all of the combinations. Um, epimers are only if there's one chiral center that changes. Um, you know, so basically all epimers are diastereomers, not all diastereomers are epimers. Um, anyway, the number two carbon here is the one that's uh, relevant. Okay, so what basically happens is uh, under strongly basic conditions, uh, you go through this uh, diol, uh, you know, an ene diol. You've got an alkene with two alcohol groups. Uh, so you've got this intermediate here. Um, and you can, of course, go back to, you know, the original uh, monosaccharide. Uh, but it's possible then instead to get, um, you know, when that carbonyl um, reforms, uh, it's possible to to have uh, the stereochemistry of that chiral center inverted. Okay, so notice that we've gone from an sp2 carbon, so from an sp3 carbon here to an sp2 carbon here, and then back to an sp3 carbon. Again, we have a racemic mixture. So um, uh, my point here is that uh, you can change the sugar itself just by you know having a strong base present. Next, let's look at oxidations and reductions. Um, the carbonyl can be reduced to an alcohol group. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can uh, take uh, you know the, aldeh uh, the aldehyde group in glucose and reduce it to a primary alcohol here using a strong reducing agent like sodium borohydride. Okay, so uh, when we do that, the uh, suffix changes from ose to etol. Okay, so you've gone from an aldose into an aldetol, All right? And so that's uh, also known as a sugar alcohol. And it's uh, basically, uh, this is one type of artificial sweetener. Okay. Uh, we could go the opposite direction. We could take an aldehyde and oxidize it to a carboxylic acid. Um, so if we use bromine as our oxidizing agent, it will only oxidize that aldehyde group. Okay, and so we only form the carboxylic acid here. Uh, please note that none of the al other alcohols are oxidized to ketones or anything like that. Okay, so just bromine uh, forms a re resulting acid. Um, we call this an aldonic acid. All right, so uh, we take that O's ending and change it to onic acid. Okay, so um, please note that we uh, only oxidize our uh, aldehydes here, right? Uh, we can't, you know, if we did this, uh, use bromine as our oxidizing agent, which I've just pointed out is mild enough not to, uh, you know, oxidize anything other than the aldehyde group, uh, ketoses won't be oxidized by something that mild. So you have to use something stronger if you want to oxidize a ketose. Okay, so uh, this includes using certain like metal ion agents, such as you know silver ions or copper two ions, uh, and this will and those will oxidize both aldoses and ketoses. Uh, the way they oxidize ketoses is they actually um, tautomerize them into uh, and uh, the ketone group into an aldehyde group, and then the aldehyde group can then be oxidized. All right, so um, any sugar that can uh, react with one of these oxidizing agents. So usually in the form of, uh, well, in the case of silver ions, it's usually in what we call Tollens reagent. Uh, or in the case of copper 2 plus ions, that's usually in the form of either Benedict's reagent or Failing's reagent. Uh, so you've probably heard of those tests for carbohydrates or for reducing sugars. Um, well, th those sugars that, that give a positive test here are known as reducing sugars. Uh, they're so called because uh, they reduce the metal ions into the metals, right? While the aldehyde group or resulting aldehyde group gets oxidized into a carboxylic acid. 
Okay, so again, this is only at that uh, carbonyl position, okay? Uh, if you want to oxidize anything other than that, you need to use something stronger as your oxidizing agent. Uh, so in this case here, we're gonna use nitric acid. If we use nitric acid as our oxidizing, uh, you know, as our oxidizing agent, not only will we oxidize uh, the aldehyde group at one end into a carboxylic acid, but we will oxidize that terminal alcohol group on our number six carbon into a carboxylic acid as well. Okay, so uh, so notice that now we have two carboxylic acids at both ends. So this is no longer uh, this is not just a gluconic acid, but this is a glucaric acid. Okay, so uh, again, the generic term here is an aldaric acid. Okay, you just take the ose ending and change it to auric acid. Now let's look at some reactions that we can, you know, use with synthetic applications. So one of these reactions is to use hydrocyanic acid, uh, which will react with sugars to make cyano cyanohydrins. Um, uh, basically, uh, at what used to be your carbonyl, well, you convert your carbonyl into an alcohol group. Uh, and then you have a nitrile group present at that same carbon. Okay, so it's kind of like a hemiacetal, uh, but instead of an alkoxy group, you've got a nitrile group. Okay, now instead of, uh, basically you can take this uh, nitrile group um, and convert it into a carboxylic acid and then reduce it into, a car uh, into an aldehyde group. Okay, so once you've done that, notice that it's kind of like the original starting molecule, but you've inserted a uh, a carbon with a hydrogen and an OH group on it. Okay, so in, in other words, you've extended your sugar's carbon chain by one more chiral carbon. For example, if you started off with a pentose, uh, you would have converted into a hexose. So that was one version of the kiliani fischer synthesis. Uh, the more recent version, which is a little bit more effective, it has higher yield because uh, instead of going via a carboxylic acid intermediate, you're going directly to the aldehyde. Uh, basically, you can use uh, you know hydrogen and a poisoned catalyst, so le uh, palladium with barium sulfate, uh, and it reduces the um, your nitrile into uh, the corresponding imine, which you can then hydrolyze into an alt directly into an aldehyde. Okay, so uh, yeah, so basically that's uh, you know so keep that that combination of reagents in mind uh, for uh, for the kiliani fischer synthesis. In other words, uh, if you have a sugar and you want to extend it by one chiral carbon, uh, you know reacted first with uh, hydrocyanic acid, and then subsequently reacted with hydrogen, uh, lead and barium sulfate as a poisoned catalyst, and subsequently hydrolyzed it with water. Okay, so uh, please note, of course, though, that you get a racemic mixture here. You get both uh, versions of that chiral carbon. Okay, uh, another, uh, uh, you know, synthetic application uh, that we can apply like you know to carbohydrates is uh, kind of the reverse uh, basically uh, you can take a, um, a monosaccharide and you can take out a chiral carbon uh, take out one of the carbons in its carbon chain so in this case here we have glucose uh, we're effectively taking out uh, the number two carbon here uh, and we're going to turn it into arabinose which is a pentose we're going from a hexose uh, to a pentose uh, so what we do here is we take um, hydroxylamine and react it with our sugar. Uh, it converts, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, our carbonyl into uh, this corresponding um, sort of hydroxylamine, all right, also known as an oxime, all right. Uh, we then react that with acetic anhydride, uh, which then converts that into the corresponding cyanohydrin. So we, we take that group and we're converting into a nitrile group. Okay, and of course, that carbon it's connected to has an alcohol group, so that's why this is technically a cyanohydrin. Uh, you then react it with an alkoxy group, uh, which uh, basically deprotonates that uh, that alcohol, and you know, and kicks off your nitrile leaving group to reform an aldehyde group. 
Okay, so just like we started off with an all dose here, you wind up with an all dose in the final step. Okay, now uh, what you've done then is you've kind of uh, you've basically taken off your your uh, carbonyl group at the end, your aldehyde group at the end, and you've converted the number two carbon into the new aldehyde group. Okay, so. So far we've been talking about monosaccharides, but I've mentioned that monosaccharides are essentially monomers. We can link together monosaccharides to form uh, chains of these, uh, of these sugars, uh, basically, you know, disaccharides and polysaccharides and so on. So a disaccharide is when two monosaccharides connect together, and they connect together through a glycosidic linkage. Now I mentioned earlier that uh, a glycoside is the acetal version of a uh, of the uh, ring form, the cyclic acetal, uh, hemiacetal version of your monosaccharide. In that, we took an alcohol and you know reacted it with our hemiacetal to convert into the acetal. Well, here our alcohol is another monosaccharide, right? We, remember, monosaccharides have alcohols all over them, so one of those is the alcohol that converts your hemiacetal into an acetal. Okay, so how these monosaccharides can link together, which alcohol groups are involved, uh, that's what uh, makes different types of disaccharides. And, you know, when we get further, you'll see it makes different types of polysaccharides as well. Okay, so it's, it's these, the difference in these glycosidic linkages that gives us different types of carbohydrates. Okay. Uh, a very common one you're going to see is a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. So what does that mean? Well, uh, remember your anomeric carbon is the uh, one that's uh, where is where uh, you know that used to be your carbonyl, and that's where uh, your hemiacetal and your acetal forms, right? It's always that carbonyl carbon. Um, so that's your number one carbon. Um, it's the number four carbon on the incoming monosaccharide, that nucleophile that causes that glycosidic linkage. Okay, so that's why it's called a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. Now, here we have maltose. Maltose is, an ex is a common example of a disaccharide where we have two glucose molecules uh, linked together through this 1,4 linkage, uh, specifically through a 1,4 alpha glycosidic linkage. Okay, so what that means is that the uh, alcohol group, that anomeric uh, carbon, right, that um, alcohol group coming off our anomeric carbon in the original um, electrophilic uh, uh, monosaccharide, that was an alpha anomer. That alcohol group was pointing downwards. Okay, So you can kind of see that w even in these two monosaccharides linked together that the, um, you know, that carbon, that, well the oxygen is pointing downwards. So you can tell that that used to be your anomeric OH group and it's in the alpha position. Okay, um, so cellobios is kind of like maltose. The only difference here is you can see that this is a beta glycoside. So it's also a 1,4 linkage, right? It's still that number four carbon on the other uh, glucose molecule coming in. Uh, but the difference is, of course, that now this oxygen's pointing upwards. Okay, so it's in the beta position. Oh, quick note here about the ability of disaccharides to be reducing sugars. Uh, even though the anomeric carbon of the uh, glucose on the left is used up, uh, so this you know anomeric carbon isn't able to convert back into an aldehyde, uh, and therefore it can't be oxidized further. Please note that the alcohol group here, here uh, over here, can be opened up. Uh, you know, this anomeric carbon can be freed up and converted back into a carbonyl, back into an aldehyde group, which can then, you know, be oxidized into a carboxylic acid, okay? Uh, and that's the case for both maltose and uh, cellobios. Both of these are reducing sugars because this anomeric carbon here and its alcohol group can be converted into an aldehyde when, when if you open up this ring. Okay. Um, here we have lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide formed by galactose and glucose. Uh, so unlike um, you know, cellobios, where you have uh, two molecules of glucose linked together by a 1,4 beta glycosidic linkage, 
uh, here we've swapped out the um, our monosaccharide on the left in our um, our electrophilic monosaccharide into uh, we've swapped that out with galactose instead of glucose. Okay. Um, oh, so by the way, the uh, you, you've probably heard of lactose intolerance. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, people who have trouble digesting lactose have trouble breaking. Uh, you know, they don't have the necessary enzymes to help break down this linkage uh, to to get the galactose and glucose out of lactose. So, in other words, it stays lactose. So your body can't. Uh, you know, people with lactose intolerance are unable to digest. Uh, this into its monosaccharides. Okay, uh, sucrose, uh, also known as table sugar, is another disaccharide. Here we have glucose connected to fructose. All right. Uh, notice that fructose here is in its beta furanose form, uh, and yeah, basically it is a one-two glycosidic linkage. All right. Now, in the case of a one-two linkage here where in the uh, the number two carbon is the uh, anomeric carbon on our ketose here. All right, so that's, remember, uh, fructose is a ketose, uh, and this is this used to be a carbonyl carbon when it's in the open form. Um, notice that this, neither of these uh, monosaccharides uh, are able to have their carbonyls reform, right? You can't open this up and reform a carbonyl because that oxygen is being used up in forming this glycosidic linkage, right? Uh, so therefore, sucrose is not a reducing sugar. Okay, so it seemed probably like a lot of these examples we've gone through were reducing sugars. Here's an example of something that's not a reducing sugar. So this would not react with uh, silver ions in Tollens reagent or copper ions, uh, copper two plus ions in Benedict's reagent or Filling's reagent. And so you would get a negative test with those. Okay. Um, so if we can link together two monosaccharides to form disaccharides, you can keep doing this and form what are known as polysaccharides, which are basically polymers of monosaccharides. Okay, so. Uh, you know, a very common example of this is cellulose. So cellulose it has a 1,4 linkage between glucose molecules. Um, so it's basically kind of like cellobiose, but just a continuous chain of it. Okay. Um, different kinds of starches are other examples of polysaccharides. Uh, so uh, they are also, you know, so for example, like um, amylose over here is also made up of glucose, but unlike uh, cellulose, where you have a 1,4 um, beta linkage, here we have a 1,4 alpha linkage. Right. Uh, amylopectin is no another example of this. Unlike amylose, uh, amylopectin uh, is branched. It, it's, uh, basically, it's like amylose, uh, but in addition to just having your 1,4 alpha glycosidic linkages uh, forming the main sort of chains of your polymer, it branches off uh, at the number six carbon. Okay, so so that alcohol group coming off your number six carbon can be the nucleophile connecting a you know an anomeric carbon on another branch so you, in other words you have a 1,6 uh, alpha linkage another variation of these sugars is to swap out an alcohol group for an amine group so uh, when we do that we call those amino sugars so uh, for example here we have uh, glucosamine uh, which just has one of these alcohol groups swapped out for a amine group, an amino group. All right. Now, if you take a glucosamine and uh, swap, uh, you know, basically acetylate it. All right. So basically, we form amides here. Uh, this corresponding uh, polymer chain of that is chitin. All right. So chitin, you may have heard of before, is the uh, kind of uh, skeletal armor on a lot of uh, invertebrates. Uh, so things like uh, crustaceans and, uh, you know, and insects uh, have like, uh, you know, their skeletons are made, or their skeletons or their shells are made up of chitin. Now in the example we just looked at with glucosamine, we swapped out that number two alcohol group for an amino group. 
Um, in the case of N-glycosides, it's the atomeric carbon that has an amine attached to it. Okay, so uh, so you can see here if we take um, a you know monosaccharide here and react it with a primary amine, we get the corresponding uh, N-glycoside, and that amino group is tacked on here. All right. Uh, again, notes that you even if you start off with only one anomer, you get a mixture of the two different anomers here. All right. So uh, again, it's going to go through an sp2 hybridized intermediate. All right. Now, if you've heard the term N-glycoside before uh, or have it ring a bell, it's you're probably thinking of it from uh, RNA and DNA. Okay. So the uh, N-glycosides in those uh, are called nucleosides. All right, so for example, uh, here we have, uh, you know, a um, ribonucleoside where we've got the ribose, uh, you know, if this were a, you know, an OH group, this would be the sugar ribose. So we've swapped out that OH group for an amine. Okay, so uh, now, of course, depending on what this, this base is, uh, you've got different types of uh, of ribonucleosides, right? And that's where you can enter uh, codes essentially into your RNA or in the case of deoxyribonucleosides, uh, notice it's deoxy because this alcohol group's missing, that's the deoxy part. Um, you know, here in the case of DNA, uh, by changing the base present here and making a polymer of these, uh, of the sugar parts of these, um, of these nucleosides, uh, we can essentially sort of put in a sort of chemical code uh, by just varying those different bases. Okay, so uh, of course, and so in the case of both RNA and DNA, there's four different uh, bases we can use, cytosine, uh, thymine, adenine, and guanine. You've probably seen those uh, abbreviated just by their initial letters, C, T, A, and G. Okay, and so just... Uh, the, you know, changing the combination of those spe those bases, the sequence at which those bases show up on your polymer chain, uh, is how DNA can store, uh, well, genetic information. Okay. Um, in the case of uh, your DNA, uh, you know, so we had a nuclear sides earlier without the phosphate group. When you tack on a phosphate group, this becomes a nucleotide. Okay, and this is actually how uh, your um, your uh, different these are each of the monomers in your DNA chain, um, and it's basically these uh, phosphate groups that connect uh, to the alcohol group on another nucleotide to make a phosphoester. Here you can see how each of our uh, you know, our nucleotides are linked together to form sort of the the backbone of your DNA strand. Okay, so this is basically how you form that that phosphoester. Notice that the uh, phosphate group on one sugar, uh, one ribose, connects to the alcohol group on another ribose. Okay, now. Uh, Basically, DNA forms complementary strands. Basically, uh, cytosine and guanine can hydrogen bond efficiently, and adenine and thymine can also efficiently hydrogen bond with each other. Uh, so that allows, um, you know, these uh, two strands of DNA to sort of link together. Okay, and so that's why when you see DNA and you see that double helix pattern, actually, I think I've got a, there's a picture on the next slide, uh, the hydrogen bonding between uh, the different bases sort sort of forms like the rungs of a ladder, okay, and cause the uh, you know that that phosphate uh, phosphoester backbone to sort of twist around. Uh, they're kind of like the uprights of the ladder, but instead of being like a vertical ladder, it's kind of almost like a spiral ladder or a spiral staircase. Okay, um, and so that's uh, basically how two complementary strands of DNA can wind together. All right, this uh, you know we're not going to go into the D, uh, into the biochemistry here, but basically when DNA replicates, it takes advantage of this fact uh, because when you uh, you know unzip a strand of DNA, you essentially can use uh, that uh, favorable hydrogen bonding interaction to sort of recreate the complementary strand. And that's how you convert one strand of DNA into two strands of DNA.
Okay, and that's how DNA replicates itself. Okay, um, I mentioned that RNA also uses four bases. Um, the the difference is a thymine. Uh, thymine is not found on RNA. You instead find uracil. Okay, so that's that's the uh, one difference. But otherwise, all the others are the same: cytosine, adenine, and guanine. All right. Um, yeah, and and they pair up very similarly as well. Okay, so again, here you can see like the strand with RNA accordingly over here. All right. Now, now the difference with RNA is that you don't get that double helix uh, like you see in DNA. All right. But but the fact that you do you can form complementary strands is again how RNA is able to replicate itself. All right. And that's it for this chapter. So uh, yeah, let's uh, go over some additional practice problems. All right, so this question's a bit of an essay one, so I'm just going to gloss over that. Um, you're probably not going to see something like that on your quiz or exam. Um, I think this is another uh, essay one, so let's skip over this one. Oh, okay, here's something that might be a little bit more applicable. Um, so here we have, uh, so take a sugar, take, you know, like let's say glucose. Um, I would start off with its, uh, in its uh, cyclic hemiacetal form. Um, and ask yourself, how would it react with an amine? Okay, and what would it make? Uh, for your amine, you could just use a generic amine. So just have like, let's say a primary amine with uh, an R group on it, you know, just the generic R group, okay? All right, so if you've taken a stab at this, uh, hopefully you would have realized that uh, your amine coming in is your nucleophile is going to attack uh, that anomeric carbon, right? So here's the mechanism for that. Here we have our, um, you know, basically our our glucose or, or sorry, our monosaccharide, and we can protonate that uh, the uh, alcohol group on that anomeric carbon, and it's a you know, make it a better leaving group, uh, and so we can make this uh, sp2 hybridized uh, intermediate, right? And so that anomeric carbon is now uh, easier for, you know, more prone to an attack from our nucleophile, so that lone pair from our, uh, you know, from our amine can attack either side of this. So here we have it attacking uh, from the top, it looks like, but we could easily have it attack from the bottom. Um, and when it does that, it forms uh, this protonated intermediate, which you can then, you know, you have an amine, you have lots of amine floating around, which is a base, you can deprotonate that and give us the neutral, um, you know, N glycoside. Okay, uh, which of the molecules discussed in this chapter could be uh, actually uh, classified as polymers? Uh, there's a lot of those, but, um, you know, so if you've, you know, paused this and thought about it, uh, this includes things like, you know, uh, you know, you can just have polysaccharides like cellulose, amylose, amylopectin, um, and all of those have gl glucose as the monomer. So, uh, again, remember, it's the glycosidic linkage, uh, the type of glycosidic linkage that changes the type of polysaccharide. Okay, I mean, of course, you can change the monomers as well, but the fact that uh, you have different types of glycosidic linkages uh, yields you greater diversity in terms of polysaccharides you can make, right? Uh, in terms of non-glycosidic linkages, uh, non-polysaccharide uh, polymers, we have uh, things like chitin, which remember was a uh, glucosamine converted uh, into an amide, so I guess uh, the clozamide, but anyway, a poly, uh, you know, a polymer of those. All right, and then of course we had DNA and RNA, uh, where you had uh, each of your monomer units linked together. Um, you know, basically you'd have a phosphate on one monomer linked together via the alcohol group and another to make a, a phosphoester bond. Okay, uh, so that's it for the chapter. Uh, these, like you probably noticed, those. Uh, Practice problems weren't super helpful, so you know do take a, a look at some of the practice problems suggested uh, in the homework. And um, yeah, if you have any questions about what's uh, coming up on the uh, like you know what the quiz is going to cover, just uh, you know feel free to ask. But again, it'll be more of the kind of um, uh, you know application type questions. So definitely like you know go over the synthetic problems we looked at, a lot of the synthetic applications, a lot of the 
you know, reactions of monosaccharides, that's going to be useful. Um, we're going to have some declarative things, so like, you know, be able to like look at uh, the structure of a monosaccharide and be able to classify it accordingly, you know, like say like, oh, this is an aldose and this is a, a tetrose or whatever, right? Um, be able to identify glycosidic linkages, uh, stuff like that, you know, so be able to like, uh, you know, classify things, be able to do application type problems involving reactions and so on. Okay, and, and as I said, if you have any questions on that, just let me know.